so that's the painting as it is right now. I still have a lot of work to do on it, you can see. But um, I'm going to be talking about the DVD that's uh, Johannes, what is it, Blut Hoist or something? I think it says something like Float House. Yeah, it's, um, uh, anyway. I'm going to put this away. Oh, float house, maybe. Germans say B's like F's. Oh, really? Yeah. Unless they're borrowed, but if they're native to German, they say it like an F. significantly in the painting if you if you have done this um, complete essentials of painting mountains then um, you will notice that the colors in the original the colors are the same. Yeah. All of that. so and I'm mostly using um, dollar store paint but I'm using some I think it's Reeve Acrylics or something. It's just a, a set, like for starters. I decided to crack open because I was frustrated with the dollar store paint. But what I was doing is just putting multiple layers of the dollar store paint on to try to get it to. It's that bad, eh? Yeah, some of it is very. Like you, you'll mix it up and it's like hair gel or something and you're like how am I going to paint this on and it has blobs and stuff you have to try to pick up it's really bad That's hilarious. some of it's awful yeah. some of it's not too bad there's um but yeah well it's all really bad actually but I mean for dollar store paint what do you expect right exactly right yeah cheapest dirt yeah so well, and I'm just learning so why spend the money on... When I was playing stuff? soccer, um, when I first started, I was yeah. learning on the job. And I'd buy the cheapest cleats possible. And uh, never buy the cheapest unless you're dealing with something like that. Uh, some, you know, the cleats were still expensive. Dollar store paint. You know, if they had dollar cleats, if they fell apart pretty quickly, it wouldn't make much difference. But uh, the the soles were just bust. They were made out of plastic. Oh. I remember one time I forgot my cleats or something like that. And we were out in Tabor. I couldn't go get them. Uh, Tabor's about 30 miles east of here. Maybe closer to 40 miles. So quite a few kilometers. And the uh, game was about to start. And there was this guy. He's a little guy. Um, he was like a Viking, you know. He, he came from Scandinavian background. And he offered me his cleats, and they were just enough I could fit them on. And I'm going, you know, he was a funny guy. He came from the West Coast, where they have a pretty good, always have had a pretty good soccer program. The Canadian Olympic team used to be centered out of the uh, University of Victoria, the capital of British Columbia. Anyway, uh, he would make the mistake. I used to make the mistake when I was getting a needle when I was a kid. They'd say, get ready. And i go, okay, I'm ready. So I'd steal Flinch my up, arm. really, yeah. <laughs> you know, the needle would practically bounce. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was like hitting bone or something yeah. like that. I used to wonder why I would cry and my sister was two years younger than me would take it like, a, as they used to say, like a man. And, uh, oh, they shame me, my parents, whomever would shame me about that. But anyway, uh, this guy, when the ball would come at him in soccer, he, you just see him, like, steal. And again, like the needles with me when I was a kid, the ball would just bounce off of him. Now, when it came to shooting, uh, he was reasonably accurate. And, of course, the ball would bounce off of his foot. He had a pretty good shot, pretty hard shot. 
But I was sitting there thinking, why would he spend so much money on these wonderful cleats? They were like kid leather. <laughs> when he had no technique when it came to receiving the ball and stuff like that. So I was figuring, geez, he just should have bought the cheap things. I hate to think what he was paying for these things. But there so, we go. I don't know. When I, so when I finally got a good use idea. fancy paint. Mm -hmm. I might actually know what I'm doing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but anyway, right now I don't. Right now my mountains. It, it's obviously um, like one thing in um, this. I'm doing the watercolor demonstration that he did because um, I don't. I'm not doing oil paints. I I wouldn't do oil painting unless I was outside and even then I don't know if I'd do it anymore. I did it when I was young and you get high off of that. It's stuff. whiffy, even yeah. outside. So I don't know I care more about my health than yeah. I care about painting mountains. So yeah. I don't know. I mean Paint I suppose if like he's talking about going into galleries and seeing um, some uh, famous artists or whatever that are, you know, their paintings that have a price tag of three thousand dollars on them, and he's thinking, well, my some of my students do art as well as these guys, or or can do better mountains, than me, better or whatever, right? Better. So, he might have been looking at Cezanne's, and those I, would be I, going for millions of dollars. But anyway, um, I I think that part of this course is really useful looking at his uh, students homework assignments and how he's going through them and stuff it's especially on disc two disc one I think they've set it, this up they haven't set it up properly because yeah you want to look at um, the there's the introduction or something like that on disc well it doesn't tell me on the disc one it doesn't have it written out what Weird. okay what is on there but anyway, presumably the chapters, disc one, whatever, but, huh? The introduction is presumably on disc one, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know what he called it, but maybe an introduction. But yeah. anyway, it's long, and it's uh, like a computer lecture, whatever, hmm. and you just look at a computer screen while he's doing stuff, and, and I found it dreadful to watch, honestly. I think it would have been better had he set up, like, the, on disc one, he does a, an oil demo that is amazing. He has like the reflections in the water and stuff are awesome. And it, had he started it with that, had that been the first thing on the disc, and then he, you know, if he just says, okay, I'm going to do this demo, but um, you'll want to look at the introduction and stuff like that first. This is just to give you an example of what you're going to be able to do. You know, and set people up that way first so that they look at it and go, holy cow, that's awesome. Then um, I, I think it would have been better. Because I, I do wonder if many people look at this DVD and they turn it on and after an hour of watching, because good luck, I dare you to not fall asleep during that introduction. Honestly, it's that bad. Uh, there's a lot of information there that he's giving people. And um, I'm, I'll probably watch it again. Because honestly, I'll give you a few of my notes that I made, but I didn't make these notes until after I was done watching the discs. So I probably missed a lot of writing a lot of stuff down that I should have, right? And like James says, well, you probably managed to internalize it without knowing, noticing that you've learned it or whatever anyway. And that might be the case. But you know what, if I have time, I will go through the whole thing again. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, the demo, they should have done the demo first on that disc one with no expectations that, oh yeah, don't, don't bother trying to follow along yet because you haven't went through the principles of what I'm trying to teach you or now, whatever. You take ballet, you start off with the basics. And? It's staggeringly boring. Now, when it comes to languages, which is a similar sort of thing. I kind of like doing what Pauline is doing. I like looking at the basics at the same time, or going back and forth, really. 
as I'm looking at, you know, like trying to interpret a poem. Yeah, well, I don't think... difficult. One thing that I was saying to James is I've been doing the Watercolor Secrets DVD um, courses, which um, that's nine DVDs, I think. Oh, okay. So it's pretty good. There's a lot of information that he really goes through a lot of stuff. Um, That's not by the same guy. That's a different guy. And um, I've been showing you... If you look in my reviews, you'll see it. But anyway... He's awesome. And uh, that one is more, it's better to start with. Uh, and this is better to follow up with later on. It's not a something that's good to start with, actually. It's something that you've already been playing around with paint for a while or whatever, and you think, yeah, I'd like to paint mountains. That's a, yeah. So I'll read some of my notes from it. No soup bowls, the eye will sink into it. So if you make a mountain and then you make like a little bowl shape or whatever, I guess um, the paint, the reader of the painting will, their eyes will sink into the bowl. So try not to do that. No V's, change them slightly. So um, a lot of the time people will put like the evergreen trees in and if you change the, you know, stagger your trees a bit and whatever, he says turn your painting upside down after you've done it, and you'll see the V's. Otherwise, you you probably won't notice them. You'll see a bunch of trees or mountains or whatever. But um, and it's better that you do that probably when you're drawing things out rather than after you've painted it, honestly. But whatever. Uh, vary the waist sizes of trees in a row. He's like, if you slap a belt around the, those trees, if they're all the same size in a row, that's not good. You want some little ones, you want some skinny ones, some fat ones, some whatever, right? Um, don't put the tallest mountain in the middle. Put it off to one side. Make the mountain ridge the only hard edge in the painting. Smudge out the treetops and everything else. The warmest snow color in the distance, coolest in the foreground. Um, and that's opposite to everything else so with snow i guess it's opposite to everything else and you may not think about it right like i'm i had if you looked at my painting it's like what are those whitish blue things on the mountain that's it's supposed to be snow and i don't know how i've made it so horrible well i mean something um, that's white is going to jump out at you yeah well something that's lighter yellow or white yeah, well, I did so i don't know how you job. fight that i don't that. know how i can but anyway, that's how it is. That's what, what's going on with my painting. The snow shadows reflect the colors from the sky. One value darker and grayer. So if you have the um, snow shadows, if you have blue sky, then it's going to be a blue-gray snow shadow. If you have orange, red, and yellow sunsetty looking or sunrise kind of sky, well, that's going to be the shadows and the snow color. Just little bit darker and grayer. You can spray off watercolor with water and let it drip off the page. He showed you, you just sp spray bottle and it just, it just went. It's awesome. And one thing that he was, and this is, I was doing this and I was having, I was so frustrated with it. He said, you're going to think that if you, you try to erase, like if you uh, use a, a harder bristle, wet brush and you try to uh, take the paint off and then you dab it with the paper towel you're gonna think if you press down hard that you're gonna be that much better to lift out the paint but in fact you're pushing it into the paper so he said just tap it gently and I've been pushing and I'm like why is this not working that's why I do not was pushing it into the paper neutralize cloud color so it won't compete with snow color and make ovalish, not roundish trees. So that's the notes that I have so far from this. And I'll probably make more if I go through it again. But uh, yeah, there were, there's a lot to learn in that. And most of it, he doesn't talk through. Most of it, um, he's showing you in the demos. You know, you, 
you just follow along and you go, oh yeah, I can see how that color of a shadow works or whatever with whatever's happening or it's great. I love the I love the demos there. Um, but like I said, the homework parts are really good too because a lot of the time he's uh, going over his students' work and he says, okay, well look at this shape here. Like he's talking about um, making really interesting abstract shapes in the mountains for like sh shadows shapes or whatever right or the the rock shapes um, and then fill it in with a uh, with variable color you know you have different um, var vari variegation or whatever of color in, in those uh, abstract shapes and he says you're going to have to do that. Don't look at your at the, your picture of the mountain or at, at if you're outside looking at the mountain and try to mimic the shape exactly. And he said, don't do that. Um, in nature, there's going to be a lot of bees. There's going to be a lot of this and, and, the, and zigzags and whatever, but you won't like it and your viewer won't like seeing it. It's something that you have to pay attention to with... Um, uh, when you're painting, you have to pay attention to how you're going to see it and how you're going to respond, how other people are going to respond when they see it too. And apparently we don't like seeing zigzags and we don't like seeing uh, the bees and stuff like that. We like abstract shapes more and stuff like that. So um, he said with the one thing I really love with, he talks about um a painting as though you're reading it he says if you put a word here and a word here and they're and a word up here and they're different sizes and that's a sentence you will not like reading that sentence you like it you like to flow along while you're reading and he said it's the same thing when you're when you're reading a painting you want to flow along with it so if you have things in the painting that are going to stop your eye in places so that you can't flow if it's jumping around you're not going to like it as much and neither are your other viewers of the painting, right? So um, he talks about with painting, it's 80% poetry in painting. That's what he's talking about poetry in painting. And honestly, I think he's right. It's 80% um, of it is your creativity that you put into it. And the 20% is the, you know, figuring out the seeing a beautiful uh, mountainscape or something like that and going oh wow you know if I had the river going this way or whatever and just you know tweaking some things so that or I need a tree there and not there or whatever and so then there's the composition and everything and there that's I guess that's a bit poetry just coming up with the composition changing the composition a bit but um, but yeah, I, th I think he's totally right with that. It's People don't often think about um, creativity in the arts that way, he like uh, being related, right? The arts being related, creativity being related, you know, even if it's, it's expressed differently, if it's expressed um, through sound, like he talks about um, changing the rhythm and, and the rhyme scheme a little bit or whatever, right? And most... Um, people doing fine art wouldn't think of it that way, I don't think. Unless they were being pretentious. Yeah. When they're actually doing the practice, they wouldn't. But then when they're trying to justify the horrendous thing they visited on the canvas, then they But that's the thing is, uh, it's, um, I mean, both are, a poem is, it should be composed. Right? Please. If and you want to be a poet, mm -hmm. please compose the thing. And a painting, composed. You have to compose please. it. You can't just, oh, I'm just going to wing it, you know. No. no. you got to work the on it. The guy who taught me taught poetry, poetry, at university. Figured the way to write a poem was to get a beginning line and to just follow it from there. Yeah. His stuff read like that. And well, James you didn't said want to some things there. to me, like um, make sure that your 
first line and your last line are the best lines in the poem. You don't want, um, if you're, you, you may have some good lines in the middle, but you definitely don't want your first line and last line to be just mediocre or, or, your worst. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and that's something, I mean, you want something, when you start out, you want something to grab the reader, right? And then when you end it, you want them to keep them keep the reader wanting to go back to it, right? You the first them, line so. should draw the reader in. Yeah. The last line should draw the reader back. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, one of the disciples of this guy who ta taught me poetry, um, he was incredible. He was near retirement age or over retirement age. He was doing a reading. It starts off with dedicated to his dad who just died. It's like a, an elegy. And uh, it's, he disappeared in the dead of winter. And I'm going, yeah, that's Yeats. And uh, not Yeats, Auden. Uh, and it's his elegy for William Butler Yeats. He disappeared in the dead of winter. You don't, don't. Here's what he said on his uh, website. The guy who stole this line. I like taking for, as first lines, first lines from obscure poems. And I'm going, are you insane? I mean, yeah, it's well, heavily anthologized, this yeah, elegy for obscure. William Butler yeah. Yeats. What? And taking first lines from poems, that's that's pretty awful anyway. Well, it's Because just... if, if a person's first line and, and last line is going to be their best lines in the poem, that's... You're the ones people remember. So I, I'm <laughs> going, I'm, I was just a guy, so I was sitting in the back, you know. He disappeared, and this guy's intoning. He disappeared in the dead of winter. And I'm going, oh, Jesus Christ. And so, of course, he followed the dictates of this guy who ta taught me and him poetry. And so the whole idea is hey, babies. what you write is basically follows from the first line. So there's the first line, stolen from W.H. Auden. No. Oh, yeah, you did say Auden. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I said Yeats at first. Yeah, but it's, I it's just in, got confused. It, it's in, in memoriam. W.B. Yeats, I think is how it's Yeah, I, I know. Yeah. We you might have actually recently. seen it, but... Um, well, we went through all the Auden stuff. Yeah. Because I, well, I like Auden. I like him. I mean, there are certain... Uh, approaches. My brother hates him. Uh, he teaches English at a university. And I'm going, yeah, yeah. Like Auden actually admitted it. You know, he said, I like just drawing away. I think he might have said a long uh, angle shot from a movie. You know how sometimes movies they draw oh, yeah, away? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he'll draw away and up. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a surprise to me to find out. You know how he did that thing in Iceland? Yeah. Where he was touring there, yeah, yeah we he have likes that book uh, around. talking about uh, geography. He loved geography. You can mm -hmm. just tell. Huh? Mm -hmm. So often yeah. he'll do landscape, and he's yeah, he's yeah, up. I can see that and my brother, I he's he's no knowledge. Of geography. He's just clueless. Yeah. Of course, he's an English, the equivalent of an English professor. He's got a PhD, and he thinks he understands. It everything oh my god Your brother loves you yeah I know not as much as he loves his political beliefs ah, anyway, anyway. Mm -hmm. do you have anything else to talk about I uh, know not really okay